traveled to Ashkelon, the coastal city just south of Tel Aviv that nudges up against the Gaza Strip. What you we're seeing here right now is the launcher. Each launcher has 20 missiles on it. You can see uh, the red light flashing, which means it's armed and ready. Here, one of the dozen or so Iron Dome batteries sits at the ready to intercept missiles and provide Israel with a type of shield from aerial attacks. I'm the Iron Dome commander. Lieutenant Colonel Iran Cohen oversees its operation. Is this as close as we get, or do we get? Uh... Uh, this is as close as we get. It took just three years and about $200 million to develop this defense system. It relies on a radar that instantly detects when a missile has been fired. Algorithms quickly try to determine what type of projectile is in the air and whether it's heading for a populated or strategic area. If so, Iron Dome launches a missile of its own. It's said that Iron Dome has taken down more than 1,000 missiles since it turned on in 2011, with a 90% success rate. Some people question the accuracy of these figures. What's clear, though, is that the algorithms capable of directing projectiles while performing a cost-benefit analysis on human life are among the most advanced in the world. This network of launchers is highly mobile and constantly on the move. This site, like many, is temporary. Everything you see here can be moved out in a matter of hours. And we move around a lot to make sure nobody knows where we are all the time. Unless you live here, it's difficult to imagine just how much this technology has transformed the lives of ordinary Israelis. Uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience, sitting in my own house and seeing rockets fired towards my house and operating this incredible system and succeeding. With the Iron Dome, when you see your house that you're protecting, and your family, and your friends, and your soldiers, uh, it's a sense of a great uh, uh, sense of pride. For many Palestinians, Iron Dome means something else. It's just the most visible part of an expansive Israeli security apparatus that includes drones, checkpoints, and espionage technology. Those tools have been put to immediate use in the West Bank, Gaza, and throughout Israel. Terrorist bombings have declined. Missiles have met their match. But lower tech forms of protest, like stabbings, are now on the rise. Hi, this is Tim with Morial TV and Morial Radio, live at Morial UK headquarters, here with James Jacob Prash, recently back from Holland, Belfast, now back home in England, Hayes Conference and a lot of other conferences coming up. And this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Good to be back in the UK. Uh, we had tremendous blessings from the Lord in Ireland, Northern Ireland. I was just recently in Holland having returned yesterday. But it's always good to be back in England. And we're looking at This Week in Prophecy. Tim is over here in England at the moment. He's up at the Morial office. I'm down near London. So let's begin this week in prophecy. The news this week of prophetic significance is, as it often is, dominated by events in the Middle East. But many of the events that are transpiring in the Middle East that are highly, highly important are being underreported by the mainstream media. They're being underreported for a combination of political reasons and also the fact that some of what's happening is not so entertaining. It's not sensationalistic, but it is important. Things are really beginning to brew as I'll come to Saudi Arabia and the House of Saud and what this will mean for the fulfillment of end time prophecy. The Israeli Defense Forces, IDF, has warned Hamas that it will retaliate strongly and the consequences for Gaza will be tremendous if Hamas carries out its threats to, as they would see it, 
um, repay Israel for destroying the terrorist tunnel and killing 15 terrorists. The Israeli military destroyed a tunnel leading from Gaza into Israel, killing at least seven people and injuring nine others. The victims were members of the armed wing of Hamas and its allied group, Islamic Jihad. Israel said the tunnel crossed into its territory and that it was built to carry out attacks. An Israeli military spokesperson said, quote, The working assumption is that this is not the only tunnel that Palestinian terrorist organizations are trying to dig. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu said it took, quote, groundbreaking technology, end quote, to discover the tunnel. The Israeli military said it is not seeking an escalation of violence with Gaza. However, both Hamas and the Islamic Jihad group have vowed revenge. Hamas used tunnels to launch surprise attacks during the 2014 Gaza war, but the group has not claimed responsibility for building the tunnel destroyed October 30th. For United News International, I'm Cambry Caldwell. Even though the tunnel was destroyed, on Israeli soil, tunneling from inside Gaza to inside Israel. The tunnel was blown up by the Israelis, by Israeli or subterranean ordnance experts from the IDF on the Israeli side of the border, killing 15 terrorists. Yet they're demanding retribution, they're demanding that there will be a counterattack in order to repay Israel for what it did. You tunnel into Israel with the aim of bringing in terrorists and explosives to kill Israelis. The Israelis locate the tunnel and blow it up on their own soil, as it were, and then you demand retaliation. It's not going to work. An Israeli general, a major general, speaking fluent Arabic, distributed videos and video recordings in the Arab world, particularly in the Gaza, warning what would happen and the retribution that Israel would take if there was any further action of this nature coming from Gaza orchestrated by Hamas. Again, that border is heating up. Now, what is interesting and what is important is there are tensions with Hezbollah and Syria in the north. The same time, simultaneously, there are tensions with Hamas in the south. Saudi Arabia is becoming increasingly alienated from Hamas, and Hamas is increasingly looking to Iran, as is Hezbollah. So you have an Iranian, an Iranian, if not initiated, certainly an Iranian capitalization of a dual threat to Israel from the south, coming from Gaza by Hamas, and from Lebanon, and potentially Syria, coming from Hezbollah and even the Iranian Revolutionary Guards who are within striking distance of the Israeli border. These things have never happened before. Iran never had that much leverage on both the northern and the southern exposure of Israel strategically. Also, because of ideological differences between Hamas and Hezbollah of the Sunni-Shia divide, They've never worked in concert together. This is beginning to change, and it raises an, a very a very acute scenario. Uh, it could result in a war fought on two fronts, in the south and in the north. That will be a proxy war between Israel and Iran. Whether or not this will relate to some kind of a Gog and Magog scenario, eventually we have to wait and see, but in the short term, Iran is getting set for a proxy war via Hamas and via Hezbollah against Israel, and Israel is posturing to respond. This week in prophecy, American-manufactured Patriot missiles deployed in Israel by the IDF shot down a Syrian drone over Syria as it headed for the Israeli border. Israel left fuming after shooting down Russian-made spy drone. The Israeli military said this morning that the drone gone down was manufactured in Vladimir Putin's Russia. Israeli military spokesman, Lt. Col. Jonathan Kanrukas, said earlier today, it is apparently Russian-manufactured and belongs to the Syrian regime. 
It was a reconnaissance of unmanned aerial vehicle and not an attack of and we are checking whether there is any connection to Iran and Hezbollah. The drone was downed with the Patriotic Interceptor missile. It was gunned to the ground over the Golan Heights, a zone that has separated Israeli and Syrian forces since the ceasefire deal that followed their 1973 war. Israeli Defense Minister Avigdor Lieberman said Israel viewed the incident gravely and would respond to any provocation. He then said the nation held the Syrian regime responsible. He said, we hold the Syrian regime responsible for any firing or breach of sovereignty and call on it to hold back all players active in its territory. The Israelis have their own version of the Patriot called the Arrow, part of their Iron Dome defense system. But they still use the American Patriot for other types of interception activities. And the Patriot, the American-made Patriot, was engaged this week in prophecy against the Syrian drone. Drone technology has been in the hands of America and of Israel for some time. It's in the hands of other powers, but increasingly, we have drone technology coming into the hands of the Iranians, coming into the hands of Islamic terrorist groups via Iran, and much of it is provided indirectly by Russia. Thus, what happened this week in prophecy, the use of a Patriot missile to take down a drone, shows that countermeasures by the West and by the Israelis are already a reality should Islamic radicalism and Islamic terrorist organizations move into drone-based aerial warfare uh, at the behest of Iran or any other Islamic power. This week in prophecy, a precedent was set with the takedown of a drone by an American Patriot missile fired by the Israelis in Galilee. Taking down the drone over Syrian territory before it was able to reach Israel. As far as is known, the drone was unarmed, although it potentially could have been. It was on a surveillance and reconnaissance mission to collect intelligence information about Israeli defenses, but it never reached the border. Into a new stage of high-tech warfare, not only with drone technology, but with counter-drone technology. The Patriot missile was designed as a short to medium term anti-ballistic missile. It was used very successfully in the first war with Iraq taking out Scud missiles before they could strike targets in Israel. They had an over 90% effectiveness rate then. The effectiveness rate, of course, based on experience and new technology, um, the Patriot is extremely, extremely effective. And it was so demonstrated this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Israeli defense establishment, with the political backing of Mr. Netanyahu's government, around something called the Iron Wall concept, the Iron Wall concept, first formulated by the early Zionist leader, Zeev Jabotinsky, who was the mentor of Menachem Begin, and he was one of the ideological founders of the Likud party, that is the party of Mr. Netanyahu. The Iron Dome is one example of the Iron Wall. The Iron Wall says Israel must have overwhelmingly proven success rate in war with a war machine that is demonstrably so powerful that its opponents will be discouraged from attacking it and seek political reconciliation. The Iron Dome is the latest addition to the Iron Wall theory put into practice. It was the Iron Wall theory, or the Iron Wall ideology of Jabotinsky, that was enacted by Menachem Begin that drew Anwar Sadat into negotiations of Camp David, in a peace treaty that has endured between Israel and Egypt. It was such also that induced Jordan to make and conclude a peace treaty with Israel. 
In other words, it's an iron wall. We're not going to be able to scale it. Therefore, since Israel becomes strategically indefeatable, we have to negotiate with Israel on peaceful terms or peaceful solutions. Jordan has done this, and Egypt has done this. But now, as we shall see shortly, something that at one time would have been unthinkable is taking place. Saudi Arabia is beginning to do this. When Camp David first happened 40 years ago, when the Amor Sadat arrived in Israel, again, it was unthinkable at that time. Unthinkable. But it certainly happened. The unthinkable happened. Well, this week in prophecy, the unthinkable is again beginning to happen. Let us move on. Coming to the United States, there are a number of government-funded and, until now, Saudi Arabian-funded Middle East centers or centers for Middle East studies at major universities, such as Georgetown <laughs> and Harvard. The curriculum for current events education in civics and history in school systems, kindergarten to 12th grade, K to 12, that is through high school, are increasingly being mandated, designed, and marketed into the school systems, public school systems, publicly funded school systems from these Middle East peace centers. They have an inherent anti-Israel bias and an inherent predisposition to be soft on radical Islam. Uh, trying to separate the cause of Palestinian nationalism from Islamic radicalism. It is a ridiculous proposition, but that is the contrived and politically sculpted, spun message coming from these so-called peace centers that are funded not only from Saudi Arabia, but are funded from the American taxpayer courtesy of the organized land. A growing concern is beginning to take place. Let us hope that there is a backlash, a backlash of this biased ideology being taught to children. Let us move on. As the Christian world begins celebrating 500 years since the onset of the Reformation of Martin Luther, let's recount certain things concerning Martin Luther that have had ramifications until the present time. Many people are aware that Martin Luther, although he began well, well, in his polemics against the Jews, directly inspired the Holocaust and the Third Reich. Adolf Hitler quoted Luther extensively in his book, Mein Kampf. We, we the German nation are to blame, for we do not kill them to prove we are believers, to prove we are Christians. The German nation, to prove it is Christian, must kill the Jews. This was the teaching of Luther. And Luther began right, initially benevolent towards the Jews, a malicious anti-Semite. But let us remember something else. In the 16th century, Islam presented a mortal threat to European security as it does today. Ferdinand and Isabella, the same who sponsored Columbus, opposed the Moors, the Islamic Moors, and drove them largely from power inside of Spain. The Islamic foothold in Southwest Europe and the Iberian Peninsula was thrown back at the precipice of the 16th century, not long before the Reformation. But at the same time, the Turkish Empire that had conquered the Byzantines, now made great strides reaching the outskirts of Vienna, having completely overrun the Balkans in Southeast Europe. This became the Ottoman threat. They were ultimately defeated and turned back by such heroes as King Jan Sobieski of Poland, who saved European civilization from an Islamic overrun. What we face today 
bears similarities to what transpired then. Only today, it is a fifth column. You've got large Islamic populations living in cities like Birmingham, Manchester, London, Paris, Brussels, etc. A fifth column. When did the Islamic threat to Europe emerge in the 16th century? Luther's primary opponent was the Roman papacy. Speaking of the Turkish Muslims, he said, we would rather have the unbaptized Turk than the baptized one, meaning the Pope. Because the Turks were at odds with the Roman Catholic interests of the Holy Roman Empire and of Catholic countries within it or Catholic domains within it, Luther took a strange position. He admitted that the Koran was a bad book and that it was a, a satanic religion and so forth. But he opposed, he opposed military exp expeditions against Islamic invaders or, or threatened Islamic invasions of Europe. He opposed it. He was in favor of essentially a placation of Islam. Now, his placation of Islam is something he justified by saying Islam is God's judgment on the Roman Catholic Church. Well, I do not deny Islam is even today God's judgment on the Judeo-Christian world. But Luther was refuted, as he often was, by somebody who initially influenced him, Erasmus of Rotterdam. Erasmus said, God may use illness and frail health. Does that mean when one is ill, they should not contact a physician? He counted Luther's arguments of placation of militant Islam. But today we see in mainstream Protestantism the same idea of the placation of militant Islam. And it has gained momentum in the World Council of Churches and in certain denominations including the Lutherans and Presbyterians, again, following the ideas of Martin Luther. Quite a problem, quite a situation. Tolerate the intolerant Muslim, tolerate the invader. That was Luther's thinking. Not all Protestants agreed with him, but most Lutherans certainly did, and it set a very, very dangerous precedent. We have to understand that Luther and Calvin both saw Islam and the papacy as the two horns of Antichrist and false prophet in the book of Revelation. That's how they saw it. They thought that Islam was as bad as the papacy and papacy as bad as Islam. I wouldn't disagree with them. I would not in principle disagree with saying one's as bad as the other, even though I don't believe the two horns are specifically the Roman Catholic uh, papacy or Islam. I do think that one is as bad as the other, ultimately. Nonetheless, the placation of radical Islam that Luther advocated in the 16th century is not different to radical Islam that we see mainstream Protestantism doing today. Bearing in mind Luther's anti-Semitism, again, has expression among liberal Protestant movements today within the World Council of Churches and within such declining movements as the Presbyterian Church of America. But let us move on. This week in prophecy, we recall what happened in the 16th century when the Reformation began? What was the attitude of the reformers towards Islam and towards the Jews? Going forward, this week in prophecy, the big news this week is what's transpiring in Saudi Arabia. Due to political pressures from the British government, from the American State Department, and from the government of Saudi Arabia, 
due to political pressure, these events are being underreported. The Saudi Arabians don't want a lot of notice being taken of what is actually happening in Saudi Arabia, and either do the American or British governments, they wish to create the air of business as usual. But it's not business as usual. Something is happening in Saudi Arabia that is absolutely radical and transforming. For some time, I've been praying against the Wahhab, the Salafists, the religious sect of the Sunni extremists who came to power in a jihad with the House of Saud. By the Wahhabist clergy, the Salafists backing the House of Saud, the House of Saud got a military victory, and you always had this cooperation between the extremely, extremely radical Salafists and the House of Saud. Something is happening. 60% of Saudi Arabia's population is under 25. At the same time, oil accounts for 90% of Saudi Arabia's gross national income. But the price of oil is no longer $100 a barrel. Just to meet its budgetary realities, the Saudi Arabian government would need oil to be at at least $77 to $80 a barrel. They're in serious trouble. They created a petrodollar-funded welfare state that is no longer fundable. This will become increasingly more pronounced with hybrid and electric cars and so forth in the future without any doubt. But the natural gas boom in the United States, compounded by the fracking boom in the United States, has changed the overall equation dramatically. It is not only Russia that is experiencing the ramifications. Even though you may have an upward adjustment of oil prices from 40 to $50 a barrel for the WTI for the West Texas intermediate rate, or even close to 60 for Brent crude coming out of Europe in the North Sea, it still would be far from adequate to fund the Saudi welfare state. The Saudi government is being forced to move into privatized education and health care, things that were always funded by oil, free for everybody. Likewise, subsidies for the madrasas, for the mosques, and for the imams cannot continue at the same pace they always have been. The House of Saud simply brought the corrupt clergy off. But now, when the money is disappearing, economic realities are again reframing the entire picture. What is actually happening in Saudi Arabia? We've been talking about the son of the 81-year-old king, Salman. King Salmon has a son who's the crown prince and as such the designated heir to the throne. He's already controlling most of the economy and nearly all of the government. His name, as we've been saying, is Mohammed bin Salmon al Saud. He's simply called by some people MBS, MBS in the Western press. This week in prophecy, the dramatic has happened. Prince Alwid bin Talal al Saud, remember these are members of an extended family. Prince Alwid bin Talal bin Saud, he is sort of the Warren Buffett of Saudi Arabia or of the Arab world as he's been described. He is the managing director of the Kingdom Fund, probably the second largest investment fund in the world. He's been arrested, charged with corruption. Can you imagine if 
someone like Warren Buffett was arrested and charged with corruption in the United States and his assets frozen? We're talking about many, many tens of billions of dollars. Now, Prince Alwid bin Talal al Saud was at the forefront of Saudi investment in the United States and in Britain. The Saudi share ownership in Fox News was him, his kingdom fund. Investment in major American media companies was him, his investment fund. Now he's in trouble. Now he's arrested. Now he is under indictment, as it were, only they don't call it that under Saudi Sharia. But he is being charged with these corruption charges that have already uncovered billions and billions of dollars in misallocated and misappropriated funds. At the same time, the second strongest economic figure in Saudi Arabia, who also has had tremendous political leverage. I speak of Prince Mutaib bin Abdullah al Saud. He was the former commander of the National Guard, which is the social stabilization mechanism in Saudi Arabia. The Mutawa, the religious police, controlled Islamic observances, forcing people to go to mosques and things like this, and the women to keep their faces covered. They're all over the place, but so are the National Guard. They are really there to maintain social order. The police are dependent on the muscle of the National Guard. But their commander and the major business figure, Prince Mutaib bin Abdullah, is also arrested, charged with fraud and corruption, and again, astronomical amounts of money are involved. He's going after the people who control the economy. The prince, the crown prince, has fired the economics minister, the ministry of minister of economics for Saudi Arabia, the equivalent of the American Secretary of Treasury and Secretary of Commerce combined or the Lord Chancellor of Great Britain. He's fired him. He's just fired him and imprisoned the two most powerful business leaders in the country who are at the forefront of, among other things, foreign investment. He is freezing the bank accounts of dozens of Saudi billionaires and hundreds of Saudi millionaires freezing their assets pending investigation. The Crown Prince MBS has also taken personal control of the Defense Ministry, the Interior Ministry, and the National Guard. He has the power of the law on his side and at his disposal, while at the same time seizing control of the economic destiny of the country. He has come up with a new draft economic plan for major change. He admits his role models are the American Bill Gates and Mark Zuckerberg, who's a Jew. He wants to remodel the, so the Saudi economy along <coughs> those lines of pursuing high-tech investment. We spoke of his plan to build a duty-free city for trade in league with Egypt and Jordan. He also wants to imitate or mimic the non-oil revenue-based economy that we find in Dubai. He will bring in certain influences of more market economies in the Persian Gulf, such as Kuwait. He is plainly moving Saudi Arabia away from what it has been an oil-funded theocracy. He is moving it away, knowing he has a social time bomb with the 60% of the population under the age of 25, no longer able to be bought off or placated by handouts from a government because of the decline of oil prices. I suppose America played its hands with the fracking and the natural gas as one major factor, but his own demographics 
mandated something be done, these things are the biggest changes to have taken place in Saudi Arabia since the House of Saud ever came to power. The Prime Minister of Lebanon is an ethnic Saudi Arabian born in Saudi Arabia, funded by Saudi Arabia. I speak of Sa'ad al Hariri. This week in prophecy, the Prime Minister of Lebanon was fired, sacked by the Saudi Arabians using their financial and economic leverage. They just politically mandated, dictated, the Prime Minister of another country would be fired because he's a Saudi Arabian reliant on Saudi funding. Money talks. Well, why did the crown prince do this? This is almost unbelievable. His reason is because the Hariri government in Lebanon failed to curtail growing Iranian influence and the power of Hezbollah as a partner in the unity government of Lebanon. It would seem like He's working hand in hand with the Israelis covertly. He has the same opponents as Israel. He's doing exactly what is in the interest of Israel. He's forcing the government of Lebanon to jettison the power and influence of Iran and its surrogate, Hezbollah, in southern Lebanon, and as a partner in the coalition government of Lebanon. This is the new crown prince. It's not just within Saudi Arabia. It's now affecting other countries in the Middle East. Of course, we have the Saudi war in Yemen, of which we have spoken much. But we also have the Saudis taking the firm stand against Qatar, Qatar, where Al Jazeera is based and located. They are faulting Qatar for Qatar's friendly relations with Iran. Now, again, you have to understand this in light of the Sunni Shia hatred. Nonetheless, Lebanon, Qatar, Yemen, and to a degree into Iraq and the other Gulf states. What's happening in Saudi Arabia <laughs> is beginning to change the equation for the entire region. This would appear to be changing in such a manner as one is left to conclude there are relations going on diplomatically and on the intelligence level between the United States, the government of Benjamin Netanyahu, the Israelis, and the House of Saud at the senior level. Obviously, United States, Israel, and the House of Saud do not want this over-publicized. They try to make it look like a pure economic reform and a war against corruption. Well, it is that, but it goes well beyond that. MBS, the Crown Prince, is dealing with the apparatus of law and social order. He's dealing with the apparatus of the economy. The Arab American oil company, Aramco, made an initial public offer that the Saudis would value at $2 trillion. That is more than twice the size of Apple in terms of capitalization and book value of the company. Foreign analysts put the value more like $1.5 trillion, but that would still be about 60% to 70% larger than Apple. Both the London and New York stock exchanges are vying to have Aramico listed on their respective stock exchanges. The British are even looking to change the rules of their exchange to make it possible for it to happen. Only 5% of the shares would be listed. But the very fact that Saudi Arabia is making an initial public offer of its lifeblood, of its oil, shows you that they know that they are heading for an economic crisis.
that they're trying to avert. <coughs> that is concurrent with the demographic socio-political bubble that is going to burst unless they take radical action now. And it may burst anyway. This transpires at the same time of the growing Iranian threat and Iranian adventurism to establish a Shia Iranian-controlled caliphate instead of ISIS that would extend from Lebanon, that is from the Mediterranean, across Syria in league with the Alawite regime of Assad, backed by Russia and Iran, through northern Iraq. Obviously, the Kurds have been an obstacle. The Israelis are an obstacle. But the Saudi Arabians are also an obstacle. There is no doubt we are seeing secret defense and intelligence cooperation between the Israelis and the Saudis, partially brokered by the Trump administration. No question. The ramifications economically alone are staggering. The proven reserves of Aramco as an oil company are 13 times larger than the proven reserves of Exxon Mobil. 13 times. They pump five times as much oil as BP, as British Petroleum. Again, this has been the dynamo, the engine of the Saudi Arabian economy. And that economy is being dismantled and reassembled progressively in a way that is quite radical by the Crown Prince. He's doing this at the same time he is amending foreign policy, and at the same time, domestic policy is being amended. It may not seem much to us in the West. But the idea of women being allowed to drive for the first time in Saudi Arabia, that sends a precedent for them. I've been to Saudi Arabia. I've seen what it's like. I know what it's like. I've been there. These things are earth moving. And it is moving the present regime in the direction of cooperation with Israel. Again, we note in the Gog and Magog Index of Nations, why do you see no Arab countries with the possible exception of Libya? Put. Why? And at that time, Put was not even Arab. Why? Why? The Assisi regime wants good defense cooperation with the Israelis in Egypt. Prince Abdullah in Jordan who is a Hashemite of Bedouin descent, knows what will happen if the Palestinian majority deposes his regime in Jordan. Again, there is secret intelligence and defense cooperation with the Israelis, up to a degree in Jordan. Now, Saudi Arabia comes into play. Secret defense and intelligence cooperation brokered by the United States involving Great Britain, but between the Saudis and the Israelis, with Iran as the common threat. All of this points directly to Daniel chapter 10, the Prince of Persia. What's happening in Saudi Arabia this week? is quite astounding. And it may only be the beginning of what the Crown Prince is doing. MBS, Mohammed bin Salman al Saud. Watch this man and watch him closely. This has been This Week in Prophecy. Thank you for listening. My name is James Jacob Prash from Morial Ministries. God bless. Thank you.